you guys hear this? No? Well, we'll have to work on that then, won't we? All right. Well, thank you for coming out. Um, we were just talking uh, uh, backstage a little bit about how incredibly out of our element all of us feel uh, in this type of environment. Uh, I'm used to talking to people I can't see, and uh, you guys are used to uh, working in behind the scenes while the audience enjoys what you do. So this is a whole new experience that I know is going to be interesting for us and hopefully for you as well. And uh, when I got the call uh, from Nick about the new book, and uh, hopefully some of you have had a chance to see it, my first question at that point went through my mind was, what was, obviously we know the story, we'll get into that in greater detail, but what did cause you guys to decide, you know what, it's time to sit down and write a book and share this? Nick? <laughs> <laughs> it's your story, Chef. Well, I think, you know, there, there was one line that really sticks out for me when, when after diagnosis and going through a couple of different institutions and finally settling on the University of Chicago to get treatment, first day of chemo, I'm sitting in the chair and I'm rapping on my computer, um, trying to work on the Alenia cookbook at the time and G-chatting and that sort of thing. And he's sitting there next to me and he kind of looks at me and he goes, you know, if you live, <laughs> I'm like, okay, the goal for you, the stuff of Oprah. <laughs> and I'm like, that's great. So you're thinking, my job is to live, right. my job is to get a book deal. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's that, nice to see you both kept up here right, under the bargain. Right, right. You know, that, that aside, um, and, and you know, we, I did say that, and we did yeah. keep an element of humor all the way through everything, which I think. Um, in any situation, everyone ultimately goes through something like this in their lives with their friends or family or whatnot. And um, you have to keep up a sense of humor about it. But in all seriousness, we went to five doctors before he sat in that chair. And so I think that part of the message and part of the reason it's important to, to share that part of it um, in a serious vein is that had he listened to the first four people, we wouldn't be sitting here. Or we might, but he wouldn't be able to be talking right now. Right. So I think there are those aspects of it that are incredibly important. And then the other thing is, how many times have you been asked, well, how did you get to be a chef and how did you get to cook this food and why did you work at Trotters for six weeks only and then why did you like Thomas so much? And he's been through all the great kitchens in, in America really and over the last 15 years. So that part of the story which people don't know is is intriguing as well, I think. Absolutely. Now, when you, you mentioned that you went to, to four different doctors mm -hmm. for the diagnosis and uh, and ultimately to try to find out what kind of treatment you could get, and the, and the first four obviously didn't give you the message you wanted to hear. No. You go to one and it tells you one thing, and you go to another and they, they reconfirm it. You go to a third. How do you keep finding the energy to go find another doctor that's going to tell you something different? Well, at the end of it, I did. And, you know, I think in the book we, we talk about at one point where Nick called me up at 8.30 in the morning and, and said, okay, come on, we're going to UFC. And I said, what's the point? They're going to say the same thing that the other four said. He goes, okay, I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> and, you know, he didn't really give me a choice. And once we, as soon as we got in that room with the three doctors and we started talking, it wasn't five minutes when I looked at him and just kind of went, holy shit. <laughs> like, we're, we're in different hands now. Like, it was very clear that that medical team was looking at medicine like exactly like I looked at food um, from a more creative, innovative approach and kind of deconstructing the tradition, deconstructing the model, putting it back together in a way that makes sense. Right. That's what I do every day. Right. So now we were talking to people that spoke the same language. And it was just... Like that. Did you feel, uh, Nick, a responsibility when you saw, you know, your friend and your partner going through this uh, incredible circumstances and not yeah. just not getting any positive news that yeah, you well, felt, felt this is your responsibility you to know, do something? I mean, I was, you, you know, you try to help people and, and, you know, I was on the phone pacing around saying, oh, even after you lose your tongue and your jaw, you'll still be a great chef. Like, you're more than some of your parts. But at some point, you just don't have your heart anymore, you know? So... That really was the last visit, I think. Like, I think if those doctors hadn't had that approach, I think I would have supported him in his decision not to get treatment at that point, which was tough. That's, you know, that's something that we wrote about in the book as well, and the reason that there are two voices in the book is because I think that's a universal thing. Like, I'm kind of the everyman in the book that deals with someone else going through it, and that's right. important. 
Mind you, that's 80 pages out of 400, you know, and it's not a huge part of the book. Right. It's definitely a huge part of the story, I think. Right. And the book itself details, like you said, a lot of other things, of, all the way from your youth and your inspiration and what caused you to, to have the uh, goals and ambitions that you did to it start at an early age, something you've always wanted to do, be a, a world-renowned chef. Yeah. Write a best-selling book. <sighs> Maybe not quite. Maybe get on Oprah. <laughs> I mean, you know, right, she's done this year, so. Yeah, yeah. we still got a chance. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, well, for me, going back to the actual book, we, we've always said it's a three part of the book. It's the inspirational cancer survival story, it's kind of untapping the creativity and the passion that goes into cooking, and it's a business book because Nick writes quite a bit about. <laughs> building Alinea and goes into great detail about the finances of it and how it came together and so I think that's important. And then going back to your question about knowing when, I remember, you know, I grew up in the kitchen. Literally my my grandmother owned a restaurant and I remember going in at a very young age with with my mom and, and, and cooking, you know, alongside of them and all my aunts and uncles were there and then Eventually, when my mother and father got their own restaurants, and I was right there in that kitchen all the way through high school. And, you know, at one point in high school, I thought about doing something else. I thought I really liked architecture. Um, I was a really poor student, very average. Uh, D minuses in chemistry, imagine that. <laughs> um, math, I was just poor, you know, because the only thing that I excelled in were things that I really enjoyed, which were using my hands with mechanical drafting or architecture, thinking of things the way they would come together. And I remember going to my father saying, you know, I think I want to do this culinary school thing. And he kind of looked at me and went, predictable, right. but maybe you want to think about it a little bit. And try to not dissuade me from going, but just spelling it out. Spelling out what it would take to to rise to the top, you know, in that field. And then I said, okay, I'm going to go to culinary school. Now, when you, when you talk about uh, your, your early start, your grandmother's kitchen and uh, your family's uh, restaurants and that kind of thing, I, I got to believe they were, they were quite a stretch from the style of food in the restaurants you're doing now. I mean, it, you, weren't, you didn't have like exploding peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in your mouth in these no. restaurants, right? <laughs> no, I mean... Which is an unbelievable idea, by the way. <laughs> there were... In, in some ways worlds apart, in other ways exactly the same. And I think that connection is something that's really important when you talk about kitchens and the culture and the language. You know, it's like, I think the reason that I ultimately was able to go to restaurants like the French Laundry in Excel were the things that were instilled at me, in me early on in those, in those kitchens that were essentially, you know, Breakfast, lunch, dinner, seven days a week, great Western omelets and meatloaf and mashed potatoes and fish fries on Friday. Right. And so from a food perspective, they were a great departure from what we do. But you learn the value of hard work, you learn discipline, you learn the sense of urgency, all of those things. And you realize that those things all apply, whether you're at a linea or the yeah, extent. Do you view it as an art, a science, or both? Both, and a craft, mm -hmm. you know, because you're very much using your hands, but yet the stuff that we do at Alinea, I, I like to say that it becomes very cerebral as well. And you're relieved it's not chemistry. Right. D minus chemistry. Yeah, right. <laughs> it cracks me up now, like I think if my, you know, junior year high school English teacher she knows that I authored a <laughs> book. <laughs> well, oddly, she's here. <laughs> Nick, what caused you, or how did the, the two of you come to be uh, partners in the Alinea? Whose idea? How did you find it? Where did you see this no, vision um, coming from? No, you know, I, I came from a family that my mom was, God bless her, wonderful woman, worst cook in the world. I was a very famous. You have the same mother? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, very finicky here growing up. Um, never had pizza until I was 13 years old. Uh, a lot of food phobias. And my wife's family was the exact opposite of that. So I got, got dragged into 
the appreciation of food. And I think it's like a lot of people, when you don't have something when you're young and you're exposed to it a little bit later in life, you get very passionate about it. And um, we started eating at some of the better restaurants. And we, I remember we went to Trio one afternoon um, for lunch. Some friends invited us and didn't know that the chef had changed, hadn't been there in a long time, a couple of years. And it was completely different. It was just completely different. And we said, I remember I said to, well, I think it was Fred, is that the yeah, server's name? Yeah, Fred DeLore. Um, and I said to the server, I said, um, what's going on? Like, this is unbelievable. And he goes, yeah, we got a new kid in the kitchen. He, he's from the French Laundry. He's blowing our minds. <laughs> he's a crazy man. <laughs> and, and, uh, and my wife said, you know, to her credit, she said, you know, this is unbelievable. We need to come back. And we, as, as we left that afternoon, we made a reservation for dinner for the following week because like, lunch was just a, a small sampling. We went to that dinner. And, this is very clear that, like, it's like meeting a young, I like to use an analogy, it's like if you met Miles Davis when he was 26 and he's just playing a totally different kind of music, and you go, wow, like, that's, that's completely different. It's from the same genre and from the same <coughs> basis and same place, but it's going in a totally different direction. And we got to know each other and got along, and I ate there way more than I should have because I kept feeling compelled to go back. And, uh, you know, we were at, one dinner on my wife's birthday, and, and, and he emailed and said, she's ethnically Latvian, speaks Japanese, loves Thai food, good luck. <coughs> and he put together an amazing meal, and during that meal, I just said, you know, if you ever want to leave here, I would love to talk to you about building a restaurant. Yeah. So that began the restaurant courtship of you two. Yeah, yeah which lasted like a week. Right. And then he, right, then he like, you know, right? I mean, it was yeah. very quick. Yeah, it was very really quick. And you would, at that point, obviously, I'm, I'm certain you always had uh, the aspiration to have your own place. You had visions of what you wanted to do. At that point of your culinary life, were you ready to go, did you think? Were you chomping up a bit to do it? I told myself when I was probably 18 that I wanted to have my own restaurant when I was 30. So I felt a certain pressure to, to move quickly. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was 25, 26. No, no. 28. And um, Ask Nikki. I did the fact. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I put that goal out there. Right. Not literally on paper, but verbally to people that were close to me. And so I felt the responsibility to uphold that. I probably really wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. Nor was he, I don't think. But somehow it worked. Yeah, it really hasn't worked out very well. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you know, we. We literally, I left Trio in August of 2004. We'll be open by October, Nick. That's what I heard over and over again. We Two months to build a restaurant. Come on. Yeah. We, wow. opened, we opened in May of 2005. Right. And when <laughs> I left, hilarious. when I left, we didn't even have a building. We had nothing. Mm -hmm. We had some ideas Except and a friend, each a, other. a young friend. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, we had nothing solid. Uh -huh. And it was a huge leap of faith, and it was actually quite naive. And a little bit foolish, but like you said, it, it sort of worked out. So day one, uh, the doors of Millennia open, the first customers are coming in, you walk in the kitchen, does uh, what the hell am I doing go through your mind? Oh my God, my, my best and worst nightmares are now realized. No, actually, the closer we got, I feel the more calm I got, because it was all very much, it was all coming together now, and it, it felt like no matter what, it was always looking forward. There was no lateral, no looking back. It was just like, we're going. This right. is it. 